Welcome to this episode of the vlog series of the Center for Law and Economics at ETH Zurich. Today we are fortunate to have Professor Saul Lefmore here from the University of Chicago Law School, who is also a former dean of the law school. So today we'll talk about your paper, SPACs, Pipes, and Common Investors, uh, which is joint work with uh, Frank Fagan from South Texas. And perhaps you could give a short summary of the main arguments of the paper. Good. Well, I think everybody is familiar with SPACs, but the way I like to think about it is we have some people who develop ideas. You could think of them working from home and they have an idea and they begin to have a company. And then they need funding to expand the company. There are many ways to do this. They could go out on the street and try to find people who are investors. They could go to a bank and try to borrow money. All these are competitor methods of trying to raise money for business. The new development of SPACs, new meaning the last 10 years, is they want somebody to invest in the company in the future, but in order to get a big investment, they really need to grow their company a little bit. And instead of going to some private equity company or a bank, there's now a third method of doing it with just SPACs. They want to find little people. By little people, I don't really mean little people. I mean, say, people who might want to invest five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, and putting many of them together will compete with banks to raise a lot of money for the company. So in this development of SPACs, somebody who thinks they're very good at finding these target companies, as I'll call them, say, oh, I'm very good at finding target companies, and I will also help run the company after we find it. And there's now a lot of complaints about the system. People say, oh, these SPAC guys make too much money. They bring in investors, and then they take many shares of the SPAC essentially free of charge. Or when they bring in small investors who invest, say, $10,000 each, these people find their shares diluted over time because the SPAC gets shares, then the SPAC brings in a big investor called a pipe in the paper, and then that pipe gets shares at lower prices. And in the end, the original people who might have paid $10 a share end up with stock that it was as if they paid $10 a share and got $5 worth of money. So there's now a big claim that these people ought to be regulated, that it's no good. The paper's central claim is not so fast. The SPAC may be a genius idea of helping people who are good at identifying target companies, or maybe, or also good at helping run these companies, and then also finding people, the pipes, who can invest a lot of money in the company, signal to smaller investors, oh, this really is a good SPAC for you to invest in. And we try to show, a little bit with data and a little bit with theory and logic, that that's a good way to think about SPACs, and they're not in need of regulation. They really are a method, SPACs really a method of helping people who want to invest small amounts of money identify a good company that is a good SPAC. There are 100 SPACs out there, they want to know which SPAC to invest in rather than put their own money in stock. And our strategy, I think the most interesting part of the strategy is to show that first of all, the SPAC might be a really good idea, and that the pipe is a signal to, the, signal to the general public, oh, we have studied this SPAC. You are people spread all around the world. You don't really know which SPAC to invest in, but we are investing in the SPAC. We are looking at other SPACs, and we are willing to put in a few million dollars, and that should be a signal to you that it's a good place to put in your $10,000. Now, the other, I think, original part of the paper is to say, well, w wait a minute, that idea sounds way too optimistic. After all, if you're giving me a bonus by being a pipe, you're signaling that this is a good SPAC to invest in, and you're getting a better price. How do I, the little investor, know this is really good? You're getting the shares at $7 a share, let's say, and I'm getting the shares at $10 a share. Maybe it's a good investment at $7, but not a good investment at $10. And we try to show, no, this actually is a very clever way to do things because even though you only spend $10 a share, even though I'm supposed to spend $10 a share and you're supposed to invest at $7 a share, it really is an important signal to me. After all, you could have bought stock in many other SPACs. The fact that you chose this SPAC is really valuable information. The analogy we use is, say, in buying, you know, say you want to buy a car. And you don't have a lot of information about a car. You could buy a Toyota. You could buy some other maker of a car. And now you go to a big rental car agency that's buying thousands of shares. Let's say thousands, sorry, that's buying thousands of cars. And you go to their lot and you see, oh, they bought Toyota. And then you think, well, they know a lot about cars. They've investigated the cars. If they're willing to buy the car, then maybe that's a good car for me to buy. I should also buy the Toyota car rather than a competitor car. 
Again, the objection might be, well, wait a minute, I have a feeling that Avis got a better price for buying this car, so how do I know that I want to buy the car $25,000 if Avis only paid $22,000? Again, the idea of the paper is, no, that is valuable information, because Avis could have bought other cars. It didn't have to buy the Toyota car. It could have got a discount price at many other car companies. So the fact that it bought the Toyota is really a good signal, and that's our argument about pipes. They could have invested in many other SPACs, they invested in this one. It really is a good investment for you. So this sounds to me a bit like a possibility theorem. Like, uh, you know, the, I see the argument that, you know, SPACs are able to, you know, address or solve a search problem and pipes are able to solve or address a confirmation problem. Um, and it reminded me a bit about the discussion on patent trolls uh, in, you know, uh, innovation policy, where people have also argued, well, patent trolls may not be that bad. They are actually solving commercialization problems. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if I think about this from a policy perspective, uh, like, yes, it could be that, you know, these uh, packs, uh, pipes and specs provide these solutions, but at what costs? What are the alternatives? Uh, are there potentially heterogeneous effects between different specs, different kinds of specs? Do you have any uh, reaction to it? Well, that's a fair question. So we do try to provide data by studying all the specs in a three-year period. And we try to show that really it's a good investment. Contrary to earlier scholarship, we try to show that if you invested in a SPAC, that is, you copied the pipes, and you invested in a SPAC, you really did pretty well. So um, in a piece about a year or two years ago, uh, which you entitled, um, I think, The uh, Eventual Decline of Empirical Law and Economics, you criticized the you know, emergence of empirical scholarship in, in law and econ. Um, I think if I'm summarizing this correctly, first, because there are methodological problems about what kind of assumptions go into, um, into regression analysis, and also because of this trend of, you know, not enough theory underlying empirical scholarship. So I'm just wondering, in your piece, which is a combination of theoretical and also empirical arguments, how you perceive the role of the empirical evidence um, that goes into the, uh, the paper? Well, self-criticism is always a good idea. One of the suggestions we make in that paper is that uh, it would be a really good idea for empirical work if people separated data more. It's easy to look at a large data set and then work backwards in a sense and find a theory. And the suggestion following modern statistical methods is that if you have a large data set, you should separate out some data, use your theory to develop something, to reinforce your theory on the data you now study, and then test your theory on the separated data. And that's exactly what we do here. We take all the known SPACs with good data in a three-year period. There are 87 such SPACs, which might not sound like a lot, but I think really is a lot. We separate the data more or less in half. We try out our theory to see if you made money investing in the SPACs and when people invested in the SPAC and so forth. And then we test the assumption on the remaining data. And it turns out to work very well. So our major criticism of much of the empirical work, I think we get out by doing you know, what we suggested. So at least in Europe, you know, there uh, is a strong emphasis on investor protection. And uh, the question uh, I think is, you know, if I'm investing in a SPAC, do I really foresee, you know, what's going on in the future, what the SPAC and the pipe is going to do? Um, so what's your response to these concerns about that, you know, the small little guy may not be able to have all the information or process the information in order to really make an informed decision when going into the SPAC space? Well, it's a fair question. I have two kinds of responses. One is that a SPAC's not for everyone. I have never invested in a SPAC personally. It's not for me. But some people have a preference to take some risk. And they like the idea of, oh, that sounds like a good, good idea. They do get to vote. After the SPAC recommends a target, they can vote on, yeah, that's a good idea or it's not a good idea. They can always exit. The whole idea of a SPAC is you can always take out your $10,000, get back your money with interest, 90% of that money has to be secured by buying government bonds, so there's no, no SPAC has ever gone bankrupt before paying out this money. So that seems really safe. And indeed, sometimes 80% of the original investors leave and new people buy their shares uh, in the SPAC. So that's the first thing. It's not for everyone. Some people like the risk. The second thing is, the big danger, I think, to the small investor, again, by small, these are people in the top 30% of the population in terms of wealth. They're only small compared to very, very wealthy people. 
But I think the big danger for them is that the SPAC guy only makes money if he does discover a target. And usually the SPAC says, oh, we'll find a target within two years, and if not, you'll have to vote to give us an additional year. So if I were an investor in a SPAC, I might worry that the SPAC will find the target just before the two or three year period comes to an end. And that's a real problem. What our data show is indeed that the return is lower the later the SPAC waits to find a target because the SPAC guy is in a rush at the end of the two year period. So often it pays to give the SPAC guy an extra year, but even then, you're a little worried the SPAC guy will immediately find a target, he'll really not put in any effort, or he'll wait and there'll be an end period problem. And indeed, our data show that the best return is a SPAC who finds the target in the middle of that period, say six months before the two year period or after two and a half years and so forth. Again, I think that reinforces the theory we put out here. So you close you know, your article, and I, uh, perhaps I quote from this, we are unable to say how often the optimistic story offered here is a fair description, but it's surely promising enough that lawmakers need to be cautious about putting hurdles in the face of specs and pipes. So if I was in Capitol Hill and I read this, and you know, my reaction might be, all right, you know, I'm a cautious guy. So, so what do I do with this you know, if I really want to implement um, you know, a policy based on you know, this and potentially other papers where, uh, you know, the effects may go in this or that direction. Does this mean that one shouldn't regulate specs at all, or um, what's the what's the policy implication? Well, I don't really like the idea of regulating specs right now because our data try to show, contrary to earlier work, that specs are probably adding to society's values. If the government were, and if you were on Capitol Hill and you really wanted to get some regulation in place, I think the most interesting regulation would be to require the targets to tell you how many spec guys had come their way and decided, no, nah, this is not a target for me. That would be very interesting information. It would be like going to buy a car and find out how many people looked at the car and did not want to buy it at the current price. It would be very valuable information. Now, we don't require that in the market. You never know how many people look at an item and don't buy it. You never know whether Warren Buffett looked at a company and did not invest in it. But that might be a very interesting kind of regulation. Find out how often a uh, target was rejected. Well, I think you've already found the highest and best use of your time, but if you do go to Capitol Hill and somehow we allow you in there, I hope you don't overregulate SPACs. All right. Thank you very much for spending time with us today, Saul, and thanks to our readers for watching this episode of the Vlog Series of the Center for Law and Economics at ETH, and hope to see you at some other time.